Amen. We'll go ahead and open your Bibles. We're going to jump in. I, uh, last week, we began looking in Revelation 4, the, what we affectionately call the beauty realm of God. This is the, where the curtains are pulled back and we get to see God the Father on His throne in His glory. And so um, what's interesting about this as we began last week looking at that picture, last week I looked at the beautiful God. This week I want to look at His beauty, beautiful elders. The beautiful God and His 24 elders. But the beautiful God. The, the book of Revelation begins with this interesting uh, verse. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Jesus <laughs> to give to us. Isn't that interesting? What a phrase. That God the Father looks over at His right hand to His Son and gives God the Son the permission to display His second coming glory to the church. Now we read the Gospels and we see His first coming glory and it undoes our hearts with love for Jesus. It makes us want Him. And the Father, at just the right time, the Apostle John has been tried to be killed twice by the Roman powers. He was boiled in oil twice. Both times didn't work. I mean, that sounds like a horrible death, but if you get in there and it doesn't work, that's pretty darn cool. How many people can say, yeah, they tried to kill me twice, boil me in oil, but I didn't boil in oil. <laughs> and so he's exiled to the bottom of a mine. He's working in a labor camp, exiled on the island of Patmos, but he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And it's in that moment when John is in the Spirit, I picture him just like we were tonight, reaching. John was in the Spirit in the bottom of a labor camp, reaching for God. And when he was in the Spirit, the Father goes, Now give it to him. Now give it to him. Give him what? Give him the revelation of your glory. He leaned his head back on your breast at the communion table, he watched you as a man on the earth. He watched you die on that cross and bleed out for love of the world. He watched you raise from the dead. But he's never seen your second coming glory. Give him that. <laughs> and when you give him that second coming glory, just like the gospels caused the church to fall in love with your first coming and your, sing and your, your uh, sacrifice your atoning sacrifice for sin, so too the revelation of your second coming glory will cause the church to want you to come again. Just as the first coming is recorded in the Gospels and we go, yes, we want you. Anybody? You I, I want him. I, I want that guy. What that guy did. God in the flesh. I want him. The book of Revelation produces the same response, which is, I want him. <laughs> Thank you for him. I want him. I want him to come and make all things new. Everything right. Everything made new. Everything that's wicked and hinders love removed. I want that God to split the heavens and come down. And it's that revelation that the same John who leaned his head on his breast at the communion table and asked him questions, and the same John that watched him bleed out for love of us, and the same John that Jesus entrusted him with his mama, that same John the apostle loved on this day gets his mind blown when Jesus gets permission by the Father to speak to John about his end time glory in his second coming. His wise leadership to fulfill the Father's plan to make all things new and for God to dwell on earth. Well, I tell you, John wasn't ready for that. It says he heard a voice like a trumpet and when he turned, he saw him and he had a garment down to his feet 
a sash of gold. His feet were like burning bronze. His face was shining like the sun. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And out of his mouth came a two-edged sword. And when I saw him, I fell as a dead man. <laughs> the same one that felt so comfortable and just kind of leaning in at the communion table now is curling up in the fetal position, undone by the glory. It says his face shone like the sun in all of its strength. And Jesus, I can just see him smiling. He loves John. John's his beloved, his favorite. I can just see him smiling going, oh, you had no idea, did you, John? <laughs> you had no idea who I am. But there's good news in his first words. This is why we love Jesus. He's that powerful. But his first words are, don't be afraid. This glory is not here to harm you. It's here to help you, John. It's here to blow your mind, young man. <laughs> of course, he's not so young anymore. Get up. I've got things to show you. <laughs> he shows him. He gives him a glimpse of his leadership of the churches in Asia Minor. And then in chapter 4, before he shows him God's blueprint to transition this age into the next age, to bring us from the temple age to the eternal age, to bring us from God partially here in the Holy Spirit in the midst of the church to God fully here, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, the fullness of the kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven, that transition before he shows John the battle plan, the blueprint, and removing everything that hinders love. Beloved, this isn't, I've heard this said many times, they call it the book of Revelations. No, it's not. It's the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's not a book predominantly about certain visions. It's a book about a man who's fully God who's ruling and reigning over all the kings of the earth and who's going to bring the kingdom of God fully to the earth one day. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so before he reveals that blueprint of God's strategy and removing everything that hinders love as Jesus returns, he wants to give us a glimpse of the throne. It's not enough just to know the blueprint. It's not enough just to know the charts. To have the entire drama mapped out and here and on this day and on that day and then this is going to come and after that plague comes this plague and then pow, shaw, all that kind of stuff. It's not enough. You've got to know who wrote the plan. You know, so much of my life I knew Jesus died on the cross. I just, I just didn't realize he dreamed it up. I knew about the cross. I just didn't know the one on the cross. I just didn't know what he was like. I wish somebody would have told me about the one who dreamed up the cross. He didn't, he didn't have to do the cross. How many of you know that? He dreamed it up. He was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. There was something in God who would sacrifice for the ones he loves, who would lay everything down for the sake of love. So he had to make a world where he could display it. What kind of God is that? Who makes atonement by the giving up of his life for the ones he loves. Oh, I tell you. And before we get to the, the blueprint of what he's going to do, he shows John who it is that dreamed it up. And it's that guy, because I tell you, after the blueprint's over, and after this life is done, it's him who we're left with. <laughs> when demons are in the right place, when all the bodies are healed, when everybody's saved that needs to be saved, who responded to the gospel, when everything's right and put in its right order, it's just him and us. So you might as well fall in love with him now. <laughs> And if you don't love him now, you're not assured that you're going to love him then. And then so if, if I just said that now and you went, oh, oh, ouch. I'm not sure if I really, I mean, I want to be, I don't want to, I don't, 
I don't want to be apart from him and like go to the second death. And uh, I, 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 I kind of want to be there, but no, it's, it's more than that. It's not that you get fire insurance and just raise your hand. There's a God out of the overflow of the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit out of the overflow of that communion, that eternal dance, He dreamed you up as the one creature made in His image to know Him forever. All the rest of the creation gets His glory on them. You get His glory in you. Who are you? Oh, this is not fire insurance. This is the internship or pure pleasure and enjoyment with the living God in union. Take advantage of your internship. I tell you, we've got, I tell you, I, I knew a lot about the cross. I just didn't know the one who dreamed up the cross, who loved me that much. I tell you, when you fall in love with the one who dreamed up the cross, New birth is just the beginning. <laughs> it's the beginning of the beginning. Beloved, you, you, we haven't even started. You need a resurrected body just to get to know him well. Oh my gosh, he has a name. I told you this last week. It says in Revelation 19, he has a name you don't know. Which means he can't reveal things about himself to you. Because you're in this fallen, weak body of death and you just blow up. I mean, can you imagine if God just showed up here? Do you know what God had to do? We think of God as being so mean. He withholds himself and then holds you eternally accountable for the little that he shows you. But it's not true. God has a dilemma. It's this. How can he keep you alive? So that he can love you forever. Did you realize when the children of Israel, when he said, Hey, I don't think I'm going to go with you. I think I'm going to send an angel. Uh, Mo Moses goes, Wait a minute, you said you would go. No, you don't get it. I'm not like punishing you. I'm trying to save you. You're so stubborn and rebellious. If I get in your midst, I'll kill all of you. Not because I'm mean, because I'm holy. I'm infinite. You're finite. I'm eternal. You're temporal. I'm holy and pure. You're sinful. I'm true, pure, perfect love. And you're rebellious, wicked, and iniquity flowing out of you all the time. I, if, if, if you're like this and I get in your midst... My world, I've refused to change. Have you ever read that verse where Jesus said, blessed are those who are, are not offended at what I'm like? He's going, I like myself. I'm beautiful and I refuse to be ugly. I'm holy and I refuse to be wicked and mean. I'm sorry if you don't like me. Can you imagine? God does everything right and 90% of the earth hates him. <laughs> and he's, he's going, he's a real person. He's not like the AI in the sky running the AI, what is it called? The algorithm. And if the algorithm catches you in sin, he <laughs> removes your status from heaven. You don't get a Facebook status in heaven. He removes it. Oh, gotcha. And if you beg him just right, work just hard enough, he gives you back your status but on probation. He might let you in if he's in a good mood. No, he's a person. He's real. He's the living God. He dreamed this whole thing up out of the overflow of his communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he brought you forth. And now he's got the dilemma of how can he fulfill his purpose and bring you near without destroying you. And so there was only one way he sent his son to die for your sin. And now that you've said yes to him, you've got a whole lot more to look forward to than fire insurance. 
whole lot more. That's what we're going to look at tonight. So John is going to see the one who dreamed up the plan, the one who dreamed up the cross, the one who dreamed up everything, the one who sits on the throne. And let's look at that in Revelation chapter 4. We're going to, we're going to pay particular attention to one thing tonight since I spent a lot of time on God, the beautiful God, last week, which we didn't scratch the surface. In the book of Job, he talks about the thunders. <laughs> And, and it says, the, it's just the, these are the mere edges. He's looking at a thunderstorm, a big powerful lightning storm and windstorm and how they reflect the knowledge of God. You know, Romans 1 says, all of creation reflects the glory of God. So therefore, no man or woman is without excuse. And he says, those thunder, that lightning, it's just the mere edges. It's like the mere edges of his garment. He imagines seeing a Category 5 hurricane and then it's just the mere edges of his power. <laughs> it's like, what? Oh, it's just the edges. So in Revelation 4, a door opens and he's going to say, John, the one who walks among the lampstands and gets the church ready for the hour of of trial and the hour of presence, presence and pressure. And after the church walks through Revelation 6 to 19, she's going to end up fully mature saying, come Lord Jesus. She's going to agree with the spirit. The spirit and the bride say come. She's going to be fully in her identity as one who's loved by him as the bride and is going to want him to come. But before that, John's going to see the one who's seated on the throne. Now look at this. And after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. A door opens. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So we talked about Jesus, the voice that he first heard that sound like a trumpet which is Jesus. Jesus is the one who opens the door. That's what we spoke of last week. Jesus opens the door to heaven. There's no other way to get in. He's the one. He opens the door, and this is good news for you. He opens it. He's the only way, but the good news is he opens it. You don't. <laughs> you get in through a new and living way. You don't have to pass by the cherubim who guard the gates that don't want, let one defiling thing enter. Those cherubim, not one defiling thing, but you don't enter through the gates. You enter through a new and living way through the torn flesh of Jesus and you pop, you start outside the gates and you pop up through that secret new living passage called Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and you pop up in the throne room. <laughs> That's good news. Then we see that he sees one on the throne, now look at verse 2. This is interesting. We don't have time to get it. There's so much here. You could spend a lifetime in this one chapter. Immediately, I was in the Spirit. Wait a minute. You were already in the Spirit, John, when he came. Yeah, but I was in the Spirit here. Yeah, but you were just in the Spirit. That, you know why this is great? Because there, you never graduate. You never get to the place where you're in the Spirit enough. The guy who's in the Spirit... Gets in the spirit more. <laughs> I love that. There's no, I'm in the spirit. Okay, here we are. No, you get in the spirit. You get in the spirit again. You get in the spirit more. You press in, you get more. You get more, more of the spirit. There's always realms of more. That's the good news. If you don't, you just live in boredom. Who, who, that's gosh awful. Who would want that? Immediately I was in the spirit. He hears the voice. He's in the spirit again. And behold, a throne sat in heaven and one sat on the throne. Now what's interesting, we talked about this last week, but he doesn't describe the throne. But all the other thrones in the Bible are described. They're described except God's throne. Because it doesn't matter about the throne. I mean, Solomon's throne is so depicted with such details, these many steps, 
this kind of gold on it, these lions here, da da, palm trees over here with da 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 da, and you're like, oh, that's amazing. That's an amazing throne. Here with John, it's like there was a throne. Yeah, what was the throne like? Don't really remember. It wasn't really that important. <laughs> it was actually the one who was on the throne was the important one. We talked about that last week. Uh, you know, in this life, you have a lot of big thrones with a lot of small men on them. <laughs> Not here. It doesn't even matter what the throne looks like. What matters is it's the one who sits on the throne. And it's that one. And look what he sees him. He says, and he who sat there was like a jasper and sardis stone in appearance. In other words, jasper, he's light. It's jasper stone is a translucent, like light. Like a jasper stone. He goes, I was looking at the one on the throne, and he was light. The Bible says God dwells in inapproachable light. In fact, when John would later write his epistle, he would say, that which I heard from the beginning, I share with you. God is light. And in him there's no darkness. It's inapproachable light though. It's not like our light. Our light, you can pass through it. His light, you can't pass through it. It's got things in it. <laughs> it's got things in the light. Like humility. Virtue. Righteousness, meekness, kindness. That light has heavy weight stuff in there. You can't press through it. It's inapproachable. <laughs> it's inapproachable. He's light. That's good news. We talked about that last week. That's your salvation. God's light. You better be glad. Can you imagine if that kind of powerful being had one bad mood? Have you, ever, have you ever thought and went, what if God had a bad hair day? What if he just woke up and went, I'm taking the whole thing out. Why? doesn't matter. I want to. You see, if there was one speck, one granule of darkness in God, we would be living in a nightmare. You would be the actor in the most insidious, capricious drama where he's just playing with you. It would be the worst horror film ever. But there's good news tonight. That which we heard from the beginning, we say to you, God is light. There is no darkness in him which means you can trust everything he says, everything he does, and you can fully believe he's going to end this thing with light. <laughs> he's not only light, he's a burning affection. He's a sardis stone, it's a red stone. He is not only light, he is radiant, righteous love. He is burning with affections for us. He's red and he's translucent white. It's just amazing. He sees these two things. I wish we had more time we could spend on that. But we got to get to the elders, people. So here we go. And he has a, a rainbow around this throne, which means if God is light, that means he's perfect. And God is burning with affection. How can he rule over sinful humanity? There's only one way. Tender mercy. Oh, if he was just light, not burning affection, we'd be in trouble. If he was just burning affection and not light, we would be in trouble. But he's both, and so he rules with tender mercy. And in that tender mercy, he governs all things. And then we talked about from there, it, we begin to see what breaks out of God. The sounds, the noises, the thunders. And from God comes what? Thunderings, lightnings, voices. Now, what's interesting about this, it isn't like the, the throne's there and a thunderstorm comes up and there's like thunder and lightning. No, it, this is different. Creation gives us a little glimpse. God's being is breaking out. <laughs> it's breaking out with lightning, thunders, and voices. It's coming from Him. 
It's emulating from him. There's not a, not a cloud that comes up. Oh, there's a cloud in the throne room. No, it's him. His being and genders breaking out of power. Do you know what he told Job? When Job, Job questioned him, he goes, oh, you want to question me? Okay, you want to question me? Then do this. Stir yourself up and break out with power over the wicked. Oh, yeah, Job, stir yourself up. Put on, and he says, put on beauty and majesty and destroy the wicked. I'll answer you then. You have God, you are perfectly potent. How do you stir up more of you? <laughs> That's another one. Like, how do you stir up when you're the mostest? Like, you're the mostest of the mostest. And he goes, I can stir myself up and put on beauty and splendor and save the whole world. If you can do that, Job, I'll answer you. Until then, put your face in the dust. Just tremble with fascination, young man. It's a lot easier than accusation. Here we go. we got to get on with it. Okay. Thunders, lightnings, voices. Listen to last week if you don't have time because there's, a, there's, some, there's some goodies in there about voices and lightnings and thunders. But the point is God's word and God's power breaks out of his being to all of creation as he sits on the throne. And you can picture it. It's not like this. It's John doesn't get called up and it's like this, like this uh, nice frolicking scene where he gets called up to heaven. He goes, oh, that's really nice. That's God right there. Oh, did you hear thunder? I think I heard thunder. Yeah, there was a little lightning. I'm pretty sure it's a blue light. I think that's lightning. No, it's not like that. He gets called up to heaven. Have you seen, have you seen what, what's the name of that movie? Um, the God of Egypt. What is it? No, the, the, the Prince of Egypt. Do you remember that? Isn't it like animation? Oh, my gosh. DreamWorks. Do you remember where he hears, he hears uh, uh, Moses comes up. He's on the backside of the desert in the burning bush, and he hears Moses. And you see the rocks all go. Take off your sandals. You're on the holy ground. Tells him what he's going to do. And you remember uh, Moses goes, no, I can't speak. And God's anger flares up because he doesn't want Moses to miss out on what he'll unfold in his life if he'll let him. He goes, am I not the one who created the tongue? And then, do you remember that scene where he picks him up into the glory, that whirlwind of... Anybody watch Prince of Egypt in this place? Am I the only one that had kids? Come on, people. That's your assignment. Go watch the cartoon. It is anointed. They did that scene. They did that scene right where the glory of God picked him up in the whirlwind. You remember that? Beloved, on this day, when John goes through that open door, it's not like a little frolicking. It's not like, what is it, Chronicles of Narnia, where you pop up by the lamppost and go, oh, what's that creature's name? No, the, 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 the what is it, the fawn. Thomas? Tumnus. It's not Tumnus. You're not getting greeted by a little fawn and frolicking through the whatever. This is the door opens, you go up, and it's like a Category 5 hurricane of light, and power, and lightning, and voices, and rumblings, and movings, where even the living creatures have hooves to dig their feet into the sea of glass so they are blown over. There's only one reason why you give a creature a hoof when they stand on glass their whole lives. To dig in and hold on. He's God. He is God. When John gets called up, it is sensory overload. When we read in Isaiah 6, God's dilemma is can he build a temple that he doesn't destroy when he manifests his glory? That's why he had to build the new Jerusalem with his own hands. Because it's the one city designed where every square centimeter will be fully saturated with his glory. 
That's why there's no temple in the New Jerusalem. It is the temple city. Every square inch is fully God's in there. Oh, I tell you, this, it is unbelievable. And John goes to the center, the government seat of that city where that power's breaking out. He is undone. He is hearing thunder. He's seeing lightning. It's going to end with him in a fetal position worshiping an angel before it's over, beloved. sensory overload and then he sees the seven spirits of God around the throne like seven flames of fire administrating God's power and glory with wisdom and then he sees the four living creatures who have the one job they have one job that's it they are stationed at the four corners around the throne positioned where they each get a different glance and they have one job to look at God and say what they see. That's it. Can you imagine they have eyes within and eyes without? They're covered with eyes everywhere. One of the strangest creatures with wings and eyes within, which means an eyes without. Eyes without are external eyes that can see God for what they're seeing right there manifesting in front of them. But it's more than that. It's intuition. It's the spirit of revelation. That's not only what they see. It's what they intuitively know by the spirit. It's like you in your Bible time. You're not seeing God with your physical eyes. But you're seeing God. You're seeing him. God let me see you. Let me see you. And those living creatures have eyes within and eyes without so they can physically see him and they can spiritually see him. And all they do is they have one job. They look at God with all those eyes. <laughs> oh, God. And they begin to stare. And they search him. And then when the hard drive feels... this picture the ram is filled up their hard drive has crashed and these creatures have a they don't have an unlimited capacity they stop they give the witness with their last little bit and then they I can just picture them just one eye opening at a time and God runs the defrag program they shake it off day or night doing that I used to think those poor living creatures I used to read that just to be honest I'd read that and go that's all they ever do they never leave I mean there's like galaxies out there that's the one job they say the same words over and over they look at the same thing over and over and over, over, over. and I'll never forget as I was reading that studying that passage another time I heard the, the Holy Spirit whispered and said no one makes them stay. Do you know what? You couldn't put a chain around a living creature's hoof and hook a 747 jet to it and pull one of them creatures out of that throne room. He would fight you. No one makes them stay. Do you know what the reward is for the truly faithful church, Philadelphia, in the Bible? They never leave. They never leave the throne room. They get God's name on their forehead. They get the name of the new Jerusalem on their forehead. And they get Jesus' new name on their forehead. 
and they never leave because when you've got him you've got everything <laughs> you couldn't pull a living creature out of the throne room if you tried no one makes them stay oh beloved that's the spirit of revelation have you been laid hold of God where no one makes you read this thing no one makes you pray no one makes you worship. You're not doing it because someone else is watching. You're doing it because you've been laid hold of. <laughs> I remember pastors used to ask me all the time. They'd go, hey, why would you do 24-7? I mean, it's kind of cool. You've been doing it for 15 years now, but don't you think that's a little out of balance? I mean, couldn't you be doing something else? And I said, can you? So I put it in perspective. I go, oh, okay, okay. Let me, let me ask you a question. What do you think the response of a living creature would be if you asked him that question? Can you imagine a pastor walking up next to a living creature? Hey. Hey, got a question. I, I could just picture like one eyeball just. <laughs> that's all they would give, just one. <laughs> Maybe half an hour. <laughs> is, isn't this a little out of balance? I mean, all you do, you never rest day or night. All you do is look at him and then say the same three phrases. <laughs> and I can almost just picture one of the living creatures going, uh, Are you looking at who we're looking at? Take your two eyes and put them right there. <laughs> Beloved, do you know what 24 7? 24 7 is not extravagant, 24 7 is our constraint. You're constrained by time here. The living creatures, they'd give him 25-8 if they could. <laughs> they don't even know what it's morning or night. <laughs> they just keep doing it. <laughs> but here's the moral of the story tonight. We didn't even get there. But here's the moral of the story tonight. The four living creatures never rest day or night saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. But do you know what? Every worship movement I've ever been a part of imagines that that verse, look at it with me, Revelation 4, verse 8, is the climax of the chapter. Did you know the living creatures aren't the honored guests in this scene? Do you know who the honored guest is? In fact, you probably didn't know. I skipped a whole entire verse. Verse 4. Before you hear any thunderings, hear any, see any lightnings, before you see anything, before you hear the living creatures, you're introduced to the special guest in the room. There's only one group that gets to sit with God as the rest of creation praises him. Look at it with me. <laughs> I think I ought to stop it right here. And you go on a study this week of why God lets the elders sit as the rest of creation praises him. Who in the world gets to sit with God as he's getting praised? God's on the throne. He's rightful to be praised. Holy, holy, holy. He's rightful. But who is this group that gets to sit with him as he's praised? <laughs> this, this is unbelievable. How can a group get to sit with God as he's receiving praise? The rest of creation, the four living creatures are a picture of all creation. They're praising and, and they're sitting there. 
with God on thrones. What in the world does that mean theologically? Look at it with me. This is crazy. Verse 4 is, is absolutely unbelievable. Look what it says. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they have crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded light. Do you see it? Until they're seated, there are no thunderings, lightnings, and voices. They're seated. It's God and them. And then everything breaks out. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Who are those elders? What do they represent? The 24 elders are the representation of the people of God throughout all of redemptive history. It's the 12 tribes in the Old Covenant, and it's the 12 apostles in the New Covenant. 24 governmental leaders representing all of the redeemed through all of human history. Kings and priests before their God. What in the world does that even mean you're a king and a priest before your God? So much so that God doesn't let the whole fanfare break out until you're seated with him. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Look at this. I mean, you're getting, this, this is, how do I say this? Beloved, I promise I'm not going to give you Mormon doctrine. I promise, but it, it's, it's I promise, it's thoroughly Christian all the way through, Orthodox Christianity. But I want you to see this. It's God is on his throne with his pantheon. The picture of this throne room is God is there on a throne, and then there's 24 other thrones. They represent the redeemed, those made in his image, and they're his pantheon of God, so to speak. God and his gods. I'm not saying you're going to get married celestially and have a planet and have celestial babies somewhere. I'm not Mormon. It's not that. But it's expressing what it means to be made in the image of God. Do you know who you are? This is what Jesus said in John chapter 10. They came to stone him and said, why are you stoning me? Because you said you were God. What do you mean? You said you were the son of God. You called yourself God. And Jesus goes, did you not read David who said you are gods, but you will all die like mere men? <laughs> I'm going to point you to it. John 10, 34 to 36, quote Psalm 82, 6. What is Psalm 82? God stands in the congregation of the gods. And he tells them they should be defending the poor, taking care of the needy, ruling on behalf to remove the wicked, but they're partial. They take bribes. They're not defending the widow and the orphan and the lonely. They're not caring. They're not walking out their image bearing. They're to reflect the nature of God. And he goes, you're all gods. That word is Elohim. God, plural. You're all gods, but you'll die like mere men. In other words, the psalmist is going, do you know who you are? You're made in the image of God to rule and reign on his behalf, but you're acting just like mere men. Wicked and iniquitous. Oh, beloved, let me, let me say this to you clearly. You will never be God, but you will never just be a man or a woman. You were the one creature made out of clay, and then God breathed heaven into your lungs. You are the mediator between heaven and earth. There's no one like you in all of creation. Angels get his glory on them. You get his glory in you. Do you know who you are? And you wonder whether he loves you? You wonder whether he likes you? Do you know who you are? Do you know what he's made you for? And this is your internship, your period 
to be trained to reign with God for all eternity. It doesn't even matter the occupation you do. Do it all for him and it will prepare you for that day when you truly reign over all things with Christ Jesus. This is unbelievable. I bet you've never heard anything like this. That's how sad it is, people. We need a restoration of Christian doctrine in the camp. Oh, God, help us. Oh, look at this. That's why David said, he made you a little lower than the angels. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels. And then you gave him. You exalted him and gave him glory and honor. You know, 1 Peter 1.12 says that angels long to look into salvation. Do you know angels are blown away? What? These little creatures? These clay vessels? They're the ones? What? Them? And they are, the angels, are servants of the saints. That's why it says in Hebrews 2, He didn't come to save angels and die an angel's death. He took on flesh and died your death. Therefore, He's not ashamed to call you His brother. You know, Jesus is your God and King, and He's your brother. You're going to see him one day and he's going to have cheekbones like Mary, eyes like Mary. You're going to look at him. You're going to look at her. You're going to look at him. You're going to look at her. And you're going to go, that's her boy. He is fully man and fully God. Do you want to know what the, the theologians call the twofold shock to principalities and powers? Is when the eternal son of God, the second person of the Trinity, that angels gazed on and worshiped night and day became a seven pound 21 inch little baby can you imagine the angel Michael the second person of the Trinity is nursing he can't formulate sentences yet He's a little kid with a, his first haircut and his first tooth falling out. Who has to deal with the bully in the school? What? Can you imagine angels are going? That's why they're worshiping. They're going, what in the world? And when demons see him, they go, we know who you are. <laughs> You're the Holy One of God. Have you come here to destroy us before our time? They knew they would be destroyed at the day of the Lord, but Jesus showed up early. Have you come to destroy us before our time? Yes, shut up and get out. Absolutely. Shut up and never speak through a human voice again. That's why he told them to shut up. They had no business speaking through the image bearer's voices. That's my treasure, my dignified creation. Don't you dare speak through their voice shut your mouth and get out now you know what the second shock to principalities and powers is when Jesus rises out of the grave and he still has a human body can you imagine the second person of the Trinity could have, you might have thought okay I'm glad we got atonement done it was necessary now that the resurrection is here I, I think it would be, be a lot easier to go back the way it was before no God doesn't even miss a beat Jesus takes up his humanity even in the resurrection forever and waltzes it says that as a man he went through the second heavens as a man putting principalities and powers under his feet as a man. As a man rises through the second heavens, puts powers into subjection, and then rises in the heaven on his own. That's a whole nother lesson. How can a human resurrected body fly? But he does. He goes right up into heaven walks right into the, past the cherubim. Yeah, you better move. I made you. 
walks right into the throne room of God and sits down at God the Father's right hand. Do you have any idea? Do you know what it says in Revelation 21? It says God's throne. The throne of God and the Lamb. It doesn't say thrones of God and the Lamb. It doesn't say two different thrones. It says one throne. God is on His throne and it's the Father and the Lamb. He's on God's throne in a human body. Do you know what that means? Do you have any idea right now Jesus in a man's body, glorified human body, sitting at the right hand of God in the throne room of God means? Do you have any idea what that means? Humanity made it. We made it. We made it. Our big brother, our God and our king had brought all of humanity. That's what he says. He rose from the dead and what did he give? He gave gifts to God. Men as gifts to God in his train. He took us with him. And he went, what? What does Ephesians say? We're seated where? In heavenly places with who? Christ Jesus. Who has what? All authority over principalities and powers. Do you have any idea who you are? Jesus is sitting there in a glorified human body. And you wonder if he likes you. Oh my God. You struggle with whether or not he likes you. Oh my God. Who likes you? This thing is so much bigger than like. This thing is bigger than just him loving you because you have a purpose. No, you have a purpose because he's madly in love with you. He made you as the one creature to bear his glory. How in the world can God make a creature that God the Son can enter and then keep that frame for the rest of eternity? Do you know when you see the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity one day, you're going to be able to touch him. Do you have any idea? You're going to be able to hear the intonation of his voice, see the inflection, uh, hear the inflection of his voice, see the different way he postures his face, see the look in his eye, and you're going to go, oh my gosh. God is a person. God is seriously personable. You know what? This is good news. You know, that, you know what that means? One day you're going to stand before the throne and you're not going to come up to an energy force. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's a great news. That is great, 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 great news. Why? Because you're not going to meet a ball of energy. No, you know who's going to greet you at the judgment seat? A man, a Jewish man with a warm smile and bright glowing eyes filled with kindness. Who's going to actually reward you for even a stinking cold glass of water given in his name. Which means he's up there thinking of ways to reward you for the most obvious things you do every day. And you actually think he's mostly mad, mostly mad, mostly dislikes your life, mostly looking for ways to count you out. Oh my gosh! Do you know who he is? And the 24 elders. It describes him here. We don't have time to get into it tonight. We don't even have time to get into it. But we will. You know what it says they are? They're enthroned. They're enrobed and they're crowned. Go meditate on that for a year or two. Who are you? I'm enthroned. No, really, who are you? I'm enrobed and I am crowned. What are you talking about? You don't know who you are, do you? You don't know what you were made for. 
You think this whole life of trial and suffering and perseverance and staying true to your vows and treating other people the way you would treat them and overcoming your failures and picking yourself back up though you fell seven times and blew it like everybody did and David did and, <laughs> and you pick yourself back up and you say yes again. You think all this is so you can kind of just go to some ethereal floating cloud called heaven and just kind of be there in some kind of ethereal state. I got in. Praise God I got fire insurance called the cross. Thank you. Didn't go to hell. Don't know what I'm here for, but I pray God I didn't go to there. No, this thing's way better than that, beloved. You are the ruling class for all the ages to come. And if you ever start believing it, you might live different. Because if you feel dirty and you feel aimless, you live dirty and you live aimless. But if you know who you are, you prepare for that day. It's amazing. How many of y'all seen like the, what is it called? The Princess Diaries or something like that. It's a girl movie. It's, that, it's got that girl with the funny smile. What's her? Yeah, yeah, that, that thing. And, uh, but every movie like that, there's somebody who's being trained for something royal being trained for something royal and they want to get out of it because it just seems easier if you leave a aim, live an aimless purposeless life <laughs> instead you got to learn Russian and French and seven different languages and how to fight with a sword and how to you know negotiate with your enemies and you know, learn the art of war and how to lead armies. and uh, That's what royalty does. They prepare their whole life to do one thing, rule. But as much as they try to get, away, get out of it, they end up what? Saying yes, because it's what they were destined for. Beloved, you may have tried to get out of this several times. But there's a reason for it your exertion, your endurance, your trials, you signing back up, you learning how to walk in humility and meekness, you extending forgiveness to others and yourself. Because you're learning, you're training to reign. You're enthroned. Oh, I tell you, we're going to talk about this more next week. But this is enough to meditate on this week. You're enthroned. You have any idea what that means? I mean, think about scriptures like this. Hebrews says that angels are messengers of flame of fire that serve the saints. They serve the saints. Do you know Revelation, Revelation 10, there's an angel that is so big, he can put one foot on the Mediterranean, in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean, and one foot in the middle of the Middle East. Now, you do the math on that. He's not like at the shoreline, kind of like in the water on the edge. No, he's got one foot in the middle of the Middle East, one foot in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean, and he's that big. Do the math. There's another angel that says he, he stands in the middle of the sun. Now, what kind of being can stand in the middle of the sun. Have you done the dimensions on the sun? That's a big angel, people. That's a massive angel. There's another angel that comes down that says when he comes down, his, the glory on him lights up the whole earth. Let me ask you a question. The sun can't even light up the whole earth. And yet there's an angel who comes down whose glory bends curves and wraps around the earth and lights the whole thing up? That's a serious angel, beloved. That's just one angel. Do you know what Paul says to the saints in Corinthians when they're living sinful and bickering and debating lives, factious lives? In 1 Corinthians 6, he's getting frustrated at them that they're suing one another. 
they actually are suing one another and taking each other to public court with their differences. And Paul looks at him and goes, what? What are you doing? He goes, do you know who you are? Is there not a man or woman of wisdom in this place? Do you not have one person that is smart enough and wise enough in the grace of God to rule on this behalf? He looks at him and goes, you're taking each other to court. You would have been better off letting them completely take all your money than to give the image bearers a bad name. You would have been better off just letting them take advantage of you than it getting known that there's nobody among the church who's wise enough to settle these issues. He goes, don't you know, and here's the catchphrase, guys. Here's the catchphrase. Don't you know you're going to judge angels one day? And you can't settle a little dispute, and yet you're going to tell angels what to do one day? Haven't you read the Lord of hosts? Jesus said, I will return in the glory of the Father and all my holy angels. What? You mean the risen Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, when he returns as the Lord of the angels, the captain of the Lord of hosts, he calls them his angels, and you're going to rule and reign with him. Whose angels are they? I won't even finish the sentence. Those things are too high for us to even think of. Like, what? We're going to judge angels? But that's scripture. You say, Alan, what does that look like? I don't have a clue. But I know this. It's awesome. And it's an awesome responsibility. So here's the question. Do you have any idea who God is? And do you have any idea who you are? And if you ever discover who he is, then you may just discover who you are. And when you do that, you'll never ask the question of was this out of balance giving him everything? Is he worth saying three words over and over and over? Holy, holy, holy. you get there, you'll do like them. You'll tell everybody else, put your two eyes on who I'm looking at. And you won't ask that question. And I just kept hearing this phrase tonight, and you wonder if he likes you. <laughs> You're dealing with the God that even when you screw up majorly, even works that together for good to those who love him and call according to his purpose. What kind of God does that? Takes your failures and then uses it to train you to reign better. And then blesses you when you turn to what? What? And you wonder whether he likes you. This is a lot bigger than liking you. You're the one creature made in his image. He has everything invested in you. All of his love. All of his forgiveness. All of his mercy. All of his kindness, all of his rewards, all of his whole presence. And you wonder if he likes you. Oh my gosh. Beloved, if we actually got what I'm saying right now, you would be running out of this building just screaming your head off all over. Do you know who he is? Do you know who we are? You were made for more than the sinner's prayer and getting fire insurance. That's your entrance <sighs> into your enthronement, your enrobement, your crowning. Read that this week if you dare. Reve I dare you. Revelation 4, Revelation 4, 4. I dare you. You just try to get your head around those three phrases. I'm seated on a throne. I'm enrobed. And I'm crowned. And while the rest of creation praises him, I get to sit down? That doesn't seem right. <laughs> that seems a little out of place. Well, we'll talk about that next week. Just go ahead and stand right where you're at.
Pablo, you can come up. You say, Alan, are you ever going to get done? I don't know. I just know this chapter is not a drive-by chapter. This chapter is a lifer. You know what they call a lifer. This thing lays hold of you your whole life, and you think you've known it, and then you read it again like I did this afternoon. I was reading it, and I went, I don't think I know anything. I, I mean, I've got a bunch of notes on this, but I, I, I'm just, it's the mere edges. I hear that question tonight. Do you know who he is, and do you know who you are? All of creation is waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Why do you think worship is erupting all over the earth? 1985, there was literally, was it 84? I think there were 25 night and day prayer expressions on the earth. Just 25 in 1984. Today, there's over 20,000 24-7 prayer and worship expressions in the earth. You know what that means? As the veil is thinning, we're beginning to discover who he is. And we don't want to stop singing. We don't want to stop worshiping. We don't want to stop giving him what he's due. That's what Pablo was singing about today. Pablo, if you're here tonight, you go, you know what? I have no clue what those verses meant that you read to me. I heard what you preached, but I, I don't know if I've wrapped my mind around it. Then go on a journey this week and wrap your mind around it. Have him blow your mind. Father, I ask you for the spirit of revelation to rest upon this house. That we would know who we are in you. That we would know the hope to which you've called us. The inheritance you have in us. The incomparably great power you have for the saints. The same power that raised you from the dead and seated you in heavenly places high above all principalities and powers and made you the head of the church which is the fullness of you in every way. What? We're the fullness of Him in every way. What? What does that mean, God? Tonight, let's just give Him our worship as we end. I, I tell you, I, I've been praying today. I go, Lord, how do you want to end this thing? Like, what do you want to do? And I just felt like He said, I, I want to I want to pierce hearts with a hunger to know him and to know who we are in light of who he is. If that's you tonight, you go, I want to hunger. I want to thirst for these things. Lord, I want to know what all the saints through all the ages have known. And yet somehow I missed it. Somehow I... I read little ditties and little cute quotes and snazzy phrases when I, when I could have a feast of who you are and who I am. Come to me. Come to me. Share with me who you are. Let the spirit of revelation touch my life. Come to me. felt like the revelation of who God is and who we are was shattering insecurity. It's like you've had a purpose in God, but you've been insecure. You, 
either your failures or how you see yourself isn't right. And the Lord is shattering those yokes of oppression that hinder you from knowing who you are, what you were made for. There's offerings to give Him. There's lessons for ruling He wants to bring you into. Some of you have let fear and insecurity. I take authority over fear. I break it. Lord, we renounce it. We want no fear and insecurity, God. We want to move into who we are in you. Help us. Everything you made us for. Everything you died for. Everything you rose for. And are praying right now at the right hand of the Father. Have your way, Jesus, with me. Have your way. Break in, God, to my heart. Am I really enrobed and crowned? What do these things mean? Let it reorient my life, Jesus. Let it bring deep meaning, deep affection, deep love for your people, for your word, for your ways. Train me to reign. I feel small in this life, but I know I was made for that throne to rule and reign with you. Come to reign with you. I was. Shatter every hindrance, every form of false humility. Nothing less than what you died for, Jesus. Do you Come to me. Who you are. Let us know. Let us see. I want to enter in my remaining day. Come to me.
Increase the measure of your presence. Oh, gather. 